Notes from the Author. How's that for a title of these podcasts? Book in installments. How about that one? How about, well, this is just Terry talking about what he's thinking at this point in time. That may be sufficient. It's Terry Wigmore talking about what's going on rattling around in my head as I continue to delve into dogma and the need to move past the fixed static view of the Bible and faith being encapsulated in text, in print, fixed and not moving and how we can get past that and to make Uh, Perhaps faith claims to be more malleable, uh, more relevant to the 21st century. So in that vein, I would like to point out that on my website, theterrywigmore.com, there are some blogs that are published, and I put one up today, Thoughts That Got Me Today. And I was struck by the image for that blog, of the square peg round hole phenomena. We've all seen this. And I've sort of made the analogy that the square peg is reality and that the round hole is the artificial construct that we have created through centuries, through eons of belief, passed on, fixed and static. And that these two are sometimes incompatible, and when they are incompatible, we tend to use a hammer to try to force the peg into our pre-existing suppositions. So that's sort of the the theme. So if you want to check that, it's a short read. Again, these things work in tandem. I write little bits here and there as I process information. I'm still working my way through John Shelby Spong's books find him to be very interesting and challenging, though as a 20 to 30 year old uh, stuck in what I would say is stuck in from this vantage point, a rigid evangelicalism in the 1980s and 90s, that uh, the message of John Shelby Spong was not really available, accessible to my ears. I was so stuck, I thought Spong really should not be wearing a cleric's collar because what he was advocating is really not anything I felt was based in the reality of Scripture. Well, there's the word reality. We create these realities. Sometimes it's based solely upon beliefs and assumptions. Sometimes it's based on scientific methodology, the creating of a hypothesis, uh, testing it, using the scientific method to come to conclusions that we might all agree with as being reality, our external world. Things are solid, they're liquid, they're gas. There are processes and laws that describe all of this stuff, ruled by mathematics. That reality oftentimes comes into conflict with the presuppositions of faith, the claims made or that Christians make on behalf of faith, speaking words on behalf of what they believe God wants them to say. And where that conflict arises, where the two realities clash, there tends to be uh, some kind of confrontation. It's usually following some kind of denial. Yeah, religion denies what science is asserting or claiming. There is usually a counterattack. Usually it's ad hominem attacking the researchers. And I used in my blog post the example of the right-wing media, conservative media, and religious right-wing evangelical pastors attacking Drs. Fauci and Burks making it personal, these ad hominem attacks are reprehensible in my opinion. We're all supposed to be working on the same side. We're supposed to be helping to uh, advance the cause of humanity, not our sectarian or um, beliefs that are more along the lines of political allegiances or what my good friend Jim calls tribalism, building your tribes, building your armies, 
and going at one each other at one another when we really should be in a boat rowing each with an oar in the same direction moving forward an oar in an unbalanced fashion goes round and round and although that circle may be of religious significance and have meaning in terms of traditional views of things like planetary motion it took a while for Copernicus view of the elliptical orbits to really become knowledge that was accepted and believed the same for Galileo and his heliocentrism we humanity are not the center of all the cosmos just because we believe we are the preeminent expression of God's creative acts as in the book of Genesis as interpreted by Jesus in the New Testament and science is saying wait a minute if we can observe that the earth is not the center what does that mean about other claims and that's where I really want to take chapter two of what I'm writing and I'll, I'll give you the tentative chapter title it's called the institutionalization of faith and then I subtitled it the problem of putting God in a box I've heard that there is a book or maybe there's an expression that goes God in the docks in which God is placed in the witness stand and tested and tried as a criminal process and I'm not suggesting that we put God on trial at all, the existence of God. I'm just suggesting that perhaps when we put limitations, restrictions, encumbrances upon what we think of God, when we think the word God, or what we believe God is capable of, the as, as Bong often says in his books, the almightiness of God. And that's probably where I got my tension, these things that are held in tension, religion, science, belief versus fact, or are, are they the same thing? Can fact also be faith? That's what I want to explore in all this uh, chapter two, the institutionalization of faith. And really, I want to take a look at a historical survey of the New Testament times and the what I would call the development, the progressive development of certain dogma expressed later on in the three four hundred ce era in the various creeds the apostles creed the nicene creed the creed of athanasius all of these creeds developed it seems to me to counter some kind of current trend current belief that was making its way around and they needed to be corrected the problem for me is that the correction by well-meaning old white people, men usually, seem to be in a certain direction. Maybe that direction is authoritarianism. Maybe that direction is maintaining a belief system. Maybe they perceive themselves to be guardians of the galaxy. I'm not sure, but I am aware that it's progressive, that it changed over time. Language changed over time. Practice changed over time. And uh, I look at today's church and the stained glass, vaulted uh, ceilings, archways, baptismal fonts, baptismal tanks, uh, speaking in tongues, practices of the gifts of the Holy Spirit or claims thereof. And all of this stuff, uh, though maybe at best I can say alluded to in New Testament times, becomes codified. That means it becomes written down and becomes entrenched and immutable. It cannot change. Otherwise, we who follow these things are left with an uncertain footing, and we can't have that. Not in the church. We have to be sure. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to do that which he's committed from now until that day. Words of songs that come trippingly off the tongue for me, at this point, sound like speaking in tongues. And I'm not sure that they hold the same meaning that I used to claim. So certainty. Remember, the title of this book is The Grace of Uncertainty. 
And part of the reason for that title is simply to say that dogma, when it becomes fixed and static, and it becomes a body that has to be conveyed and transmitted with every jot and tittle, every dot of the letter I, every cross of the letter T, must be accurate and passed on in entirety. I'm not sure that that process has any validity in our understanding anymore. So I have some questions, and I'm probably just going to spend some time uh, reviewing these questions. Questions? Well, yeah. Remember I refer to David Dark and the sacredness of questioning everything? Yeah, I agree with that. So here's a question. How did the spiritual, dynamic, and decentralized early church become codified, regulated, consolidated, centralized, and transmitted over the last, well, let's say 2,000 years of New Testament history. Um, that's a concern for me. The question implies a whole bunch of things. One, it is spiritual. So how do you measure that becomes a concern. It is dynamic. So I look at the, the book of Acts in the early church and gathering in the upper room and the tongues of fire on, on the apostles' heads, and I'm saying, okay, it's dynamic. That means it's it's changing, it's fluid, it's, it's morphing, it's adapting, it's going out and becoming all things to all people. And it certainly was decentralized. It, it started maybe in the upper room, but boom, it went out everywhere. And people couldn't stop talking about it, so I'm interested in that. So I use the word spiritual, dynamic, decentralized, early church. Now, as soon as I put in the word church, I would like to refer that word to maybe a simplistic version of it and call the church really just a gathering of ones and twos, or maybe to be more biblical, the twos and threes. So that's what I mean by the early church. How did that loose affiliation of people sharing what they were experiencing, their personal experiences, become regulated. You have to do this. You have to put people here. You should put people there. How did the church become an extension of the synagogue? What did we carry over into modern church practices that maybe should have been left? In fact, should there be a church? Should there just be an assembly of people who believe rent a gymnasium, uh, meet in somebody's basement. We, we've tried all that in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Maybe it's still going on. I'm not sure, but I'm not certain about the centralized stuff where you need a hierarchy, where you need authority, you need bishops, you need archbishops, you need popes, you need centralization for what? Gathering wealth? Centralization for what? Promoting programs of indoctrination? What do you need centralization for? To become a government unto yourself, as in the Vatican itself is its own government. Um, I'm not sure that we should be interested in any of these things. So that is what I want to explore in chapter 2. As well, I'm going to extend that idea and ask the question, what was under Jesus' novel? That means new and refreshing, maybe even antithetical to existing practices and beliefs in the uh, Jewish community in the area that Jesus was touring and speaking. So I'm interested in that process because it's new, it's fluid, that means it's moving. It's, it's got an impact that's moving like currents in a stream. It was radical. And how did that become boxed in by the rules? How did it become so written down, I'm sure there were no scribes with their uh, wax tablets and styluses writing down everything Jesus said. And I'm sure those who were educated in that way maybe didn't even know Aramaic, which is what Jesus was speaking. So I'm not sure how that whole process worked. So given that Jesus was speaking, and that speaking is an oral tradition, when that became written down, what was lost in translation, a great Bill Murray film. Something does get lost. And that whole thing about newness, about movement, of spirituality, of radicalism, 
becomes tamed, becomes boxed, becomes constrained, becomes organized, becomes modeled, and becomes a package that's in a binder that's got, you know, I don't know, five hole punches that's got tabs and dividers, and it's about five inches thick, and everybody who attends the seminar gets a package like that, and that's what you come away with, and you've got to replicate that everywhere you go, in every community, village, every country, industrialized, non-industrialized, agrarian, industrial, uh, doesn't matter where you, you do it. Doesn't matter what language you do it. So the church now becomes some kind of organization that resembles a government with all the structure and institutions and power constraining mechanisms of governments, the power to make laws, to enforce the laws. Does that sound familiar? The uh, executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch to weigh it. In the blog I posted this morning, I talked about the Inquisition as a governmental institution, a method of enforcing correction upon the people who diverged. And we have mechanisms like that, uh, whether it's excommunication or whether it's an informal meeting of people. It's a, a process of correction. We say it's correction. I'm not sure what it is. It certainly is enforcing uniformity. And I'm not sure that correction then is the right word. Uniformity of belief is not correction. It is constraint. So I'm interested in the whole question of how and when the church emerged as a political and economic force an engine of um, replication of itself in local manifestations of churches, local assemblies, instead of being what I think it should have been and could still be in the future, a charitable service, an NGO, non-aligned government organization, loosely affiliated, promoting goodwill and change in the West. The church's mission seems to have become self-serving. That is, it exists to propagate itself through dogma, through liturgies, robes, rules, colors, censure, punishment, creating laws, protecting itself. Is that what we mean by dogma? And is that good? All right, that's it for now. I'm Terry. You can follow this stuff. I'll be publishing a podcast like this explaining where I'm going in my thoughts. And it'll be a combination of referencing the blogs that I post on terrywigmore.com. Again, these are just thoughts rolling around and I can hear them clinking as I shake my head. Shake, rattle, and roll. I feel like I've got googly eyes sometimes. Well, that's it for this morning. Do take care. Happy 2022, everyone. Regardless of what it holds for you, may it be a year of safety, prosperity, throw in a little bit of joy and goodness, and I think we'll have a good year. Take care now. Bye-bye.